Hi, I'm Jen Drummond. Welcome to Seek Your Summit. As a mom, a business owner, and the first female to climb the seven second summits, I realize that the mountains we climb are a part of our success. And it is up to us to go beyond that success into a life of significance. All right, today I have a hero of mine on the podcast, if I had to be honest, Heather Moynihan. So Heather, thank you for joining me. My gosh, my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here with you. Ah! No. So when I first got into speaking, you were my person that I stalked and followed and looked at and took guidance from. And I'm like, hey, she gets me. She gets it. So it's so fun to have you here in studio live. I'm so, so thank excited you. to be here with you. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your story, my audience doesn't really know. You were the corporate girl doing the ladder, doing all the things. So talk to us about that. Yeah. So I came from nothing and was told my entire life, you know, women don't make it to the C-suite. And so I became really focused on this idea of, I want to make it to the C-suite. So I did. And so I just essentially outworked everybody. You know, while all my friends were out getting married and having kids, I was moving around the country doing deals and building a name for myself in business. And um, ultimately, ended up a, a VP of sales at a media company, was there for 14 years, promoted three times, became chief revenue officer. And then unexpectedly, after a phenomenal career, the CEO I worked for um, became ill and he elevated his daughter to replace him and she fired me immediately. Oh, <sighs> like no warning, nothing, like nothing. No, it's just one of those stories that, and I think a lot of people understand this, women who have been in corporate or are in corporate, that's the one elephant in the room nobody ever speaks about, which is, the person that's probably going to stab me in the back is going to be another woman, not a man. Isn't that crazy? It's terrible. It's, it's terrible. terrible. I know. It drives me nuts. Like we're here to elevate each other and raise each other and support each other. And it's the worst thing when we see each other knocking each other down. But the craziest thing is it ended up being the biggest blessing of my business life. With, okay. Hands down, without a doubt. I didn't know it at the time, of course. You know, I was devastated at the time. I'm a single mom. I had an 18 month non-compete. So I had to start over somewhere as a rookie, as a beginner. And I had no idea where I was going to start or what I was going to do. So the time that that moment was awful, but you know, here we are, um, as we were talking about, it's almost six years now later. And I'm so grateful that that woman fired me. Yeah. Because it forced you into a soul searching. Who am I? What am I? How do I contribute? Exactly. Like to reinvent myself and do something completely different that I never would have done in a million years if I hadn't been fired. Right. So what happened after you were fired? What was the next step for you? Yeah. The next step was I drove home three hours crying the entire way because I was devastated. I couldn't believe I was in shock. And then I got home. I drank a bottle of Chardonnay, not a glass, went under a weighted blanket. Highly recommend to everyone if you don't have one for anxiety ridden moments. And then I told everyone in my life, don't come to me asking for anything. I need, uh, give me a minute. And after 24 hours, I noticed nobody was calling me. You know, this industry I'd been in for over 20 years, I had a great name and no one was even reaching out to me. So I put a post up on social media and it said, I've just been fired. If I've ever done anything for you, I need to hear from you now. And everyone started calling me saying, take that post down. You look so pathetic. And I checked in with the one voice and opinion that matters, your own. And I just thought I didn't do anything for that lady to hate me just other than being me. I think I did a great job you know, the facts and results speak for themselves. I'm going to go ahead and own this post. And so I thanked everybody for their beliefs, but I said, I'm leaving the post up. That post went viral, reached millions of people, and then landed me on the Elvis Duran show, which completely changed my life. Okay. So bring us to that show. Yeah. So I walked out. I, I knew this. I, you know, I'd been in one bubble and one arena for 20 something years, the media business. Mm -hmm. And while people might think that sounds big, it's not. It's like anything. If you're in personal development, that's just one little world. Like everything's one little world. And wherever anyone is right now, get burst your bubble, go start speaking to people in different industries, start going to different events. I hadn't been doing that. And that was an error on my part. But I knew if I need to reinvent myself, I got to start learning about different businesses, different business models, different industries. I need to start meeting people outside of my bubble. How can I do that? And when I received a tweet from Froggy from the Elvis Duran show, it said, how can I help you? I said, get me on the show. And I didn't know why I wanted to go on other than it was out of my bubble. Like this was a different arena, right? To be a guest on a show, I had been the one driving revenue, selling the ads on shows and media. To put myself on the other side of the microphone was a big risk. It was going to expand my reach. 
And um, I flew to New York, uh, went on that show. And halfway through that interview, Elvis said to me, well, Heather, obviously you're writing a book, but I wasn't. You weren't. I wasn't. I hadn't even thought about writing a book. I had a sister who was, you know, the smart one. I was the social one. I always thought the smart people write the books and the social people lead sales teams and drive revenue. And in that moment, he just spoke a belief into me. I jumped on the plane. I Googled, how do you write a book? Yeah. And I said, basically, you just need time to sit there and, and do it. And so I thought, great, I've been fired. That'll be my next um, endeavor. So that's how you started writing the book. Wow. When did you get a literary agent then? I self-published my first book, so I did not. Okay. My second book, um, a few years later, I got a literary agent. I just Googled, you know, who are the top females in personal development, and then I figured out who all their agents were, and then I just started pitching their agents. Okay. See how action-oriented Heather is? This is what I love about her. Like, all of her tips are, here's what I wanted to do, and then I did it. It wasn't, here's what I need to do, and now I'm going to think of a thousand reasons why I can't. You just do it. Like that's when your superpowers, it's magic. But I also feel like that's anyone who's been in sales, anyone who's had a career in sales, you know, the money isn't going to show up at your doorstep. You need to take some type of action, deliberate action and, and go out and get it and find it. And once you build that muscle, it's hard to unlearn it. No, yeah, that's true. And it is a muscle. So you self-publish your own book. What happens after that? My family told me not to publish it. They said, this is a terrible idea. My mom stopped talking to me. My smart sister, the attorney, said, you're probably going to get sued. I don't think you should do this. So everyone in my innermost circle was telling me, no, no, no. Luckily, I checked in with, I had invested in myself and hired an editor. He had written 19 books. I called him. I said, my family is telling me we, we shouldn't do this. He said, your book's coming out in a week. I said, I think we need to scrap it. And he said, let me ask you one question. How many books has your family written? Mm. And I said, zero. And he's like, great, that's your answer. Take advice from me. And I learned such a powerful lesson. Never take advice from or direction from someone who hasn't been where you're going. They might mean well for you. And they were trying to protect me. Mm -hmm. But you need to seek direction and advice from someone who's been on the road and path that you want to go down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that when I was climbing Everest. I called my parents. They're like, um, no, you're not. I'm like, well, cute I am. Like, it's dangerous. It's da, 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 da. I know you know what you know. Believe me, I've done my research, my due diligence. This feels right for me, so I'm doing it. And then when you step into that confidence, they have no choice but to jump on because otherwise they become excluded in the pursuit. And so luckily mine all jumped on. I'm assuming yours all did too eventually. It took a little while, but yeah, eventually. Yeah, yeah, eventually yeah. They, they all come around eventually. <laughs> okay, so the book publishes. You're told by your inner circle, don't do it. You trust the editor because he's done it before. And that's where we should take advice as people who have been to the places that we want to go. What happens next? I Googled, how do you sell books? And it said, speak. And I had been speaking for 20 years in corporate America. And I had no idea you could get paid for it because in my small bubble, we didn't pay people. People wanted to speak on our stages for free because we had reach of millions and millions of people. So no one ever paid me. No one ever paid the people that would come in. It That was a foreign concept to me. So I just started cold calling businesses and saying, hey, if I come in, I'll speak to your team about building confidence and innovation in the, in the workplace. Will you buy 500 books? Will you buy 1,000 books? And that was my pitch. And so that worked, you know, and then inevitably, one day I called a company and they said, sure, what's your speaker fee? And I said, hang on a second. And I Googled, what is speaker fee? And Gary Vaynerchuk came up. And at the time, it was 2018. He was making $350,000 for a 60-minute keynote. Wow. And I just saw that number. And I thought, I'm in the wrong game. I'm switching to speaking. And so I just went all in on the speaking business at that point. <laughs> it was crazy. So you're on the phone with this lady. She's like, what's your speaker fee? You're Googling it. You see Gary V. He's charging an astronomical amount. What moment did you tell her? I think at the time I said $5,000. Like I had no oh, idea course, what, right. the, I didn't know what to quote. I, I didn't have any, you know, here we are five years later. I know the business. I didn't know it at the time. And like anyone, you're a beginner, but you're, before you're anything else, you're going to make mistakes. Obviously I should have said a higher number, but I'm so proud of myself for saying something. Cause that was a first, right. To ask for money for the first one, you have to start somewhere. Right. Okay. So you do this speech and then now are you pitching yourself to more places or how are you continuing to build this business and get momentum there? Well, I started researching, you know, like anything. I didn't know anything about that business. So I had to learn the speaking business quickly. So I looked at potential competitors, right? Like I researched Sarah Blakely, Brene Brown, Mel Robbins. 
and I would go to their pages. I would go to the speaker bureaus they were with. And then so I just created a roster and list of, I need to get on this speaker bureau, this speaker. Like, I thought that was the answer at first, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really for, for me, but it, it is for some people. And so I just started pitching myself to, a, a, you know, a, a number of different bureaus. And I went to the largest one first, Harry Walker, and never take a no from someone who can't tell you yes. So I went to the CEO and I pitched him on me and he was so sweet to respond. And he, he said, thank you so much for reaching out. However, we have plenty of speakers and don't need anyone. When you are able to show up as unique and different from somebody on my roster, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. Just being polite, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what advice though, like not saying no, you wasted my time. Very nice. Like no, but very, very here's nice. what we need different. We need something unique. Right. And right. so a week later, my book, Confidence Creator, Trump, Donald Trump, who was the president at the time, for number one in the business biography list. Wow. So I took a screenshot of that um, on Amazon and I emailed him back and I said, oh my gosh, great news. I finally have become unique and different. You have no one on your speaker roster that is currently trumping the president for number one in the business biography list. And he said, touche, and he added me. And then I took the screenshot of him adding me. They had me pictured next to Bill Clinton for whatever reason, I don't know why. And so I took that screenshot and I started leveraging that to land all the other bureaus. Oh, wow. So how many bureaus were you working with? I'm, I think I'm on all of them now. Okay. I mean, there's, there's so many. It's, it's like, there's like 30 something. It's insane. Yeah. 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 And you're just like, okay, the more people that have my name to help pitch me out, the better. Do you find that most of your deals come from pitches like that still? Or are you still generating them? No, I generate the majority. I mean, I generate probably 80% of my business through LinkedIn specifically. LinkedIn specifically. Wow. So of all social media platforms getting into that, do you feel LinkedIn's the best one for your industry? For It's a place where business gets done. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Instagram is definitely more um, social networking and, you know, learning about people. But I, I get very little business from the average user on Instagram doesn't have the wherewithal to spend for a keynote speaker is, is what my understanding is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so you've built the speaking career and you've been giving speeches all over the place. And then you wrote, where was the second book in this picture? 2021, I think. Okay, yeah. okay. So like two years into the speaking career, mm -hmm. you launch a second book. Mm -hmm. And what was the concept to ha why that? Because it brought you into the limelight again, or what were you hoping for the second one? You know, just people, when people, in my opinion, when your community is asking the same question over and over again, mm -hmm. you got to find a way to be more efficient in answering it. I can't answer all the DM. Nobody has time to, to do that. Doesn't, right? It's not profitable. It's not going to move your business forward. And no one can scale individually like that. So I just kept noticing, I'm getting asked the same question. How did you do this? How did you get to the next level? Then how did you go here? So I'm like, I might as well just map it out for everybody so that everyone can learn how they can do it for themselves. And that's where the idea for the second book came from. Okay. And then did that give your speaking career another boost? I, I don't know, because everything was done virtually. My first book actually did better because I was everywhere in person. My second book, everything was virtual because of COVID. Right. And so it just was much, it was a lackluster event versus what I had experienced my first time. Yeah. 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 COVID kind of did that to all of us. Even when I'm giving speeches virtually instead of in person, like the number of book buys and all that is entirely different numbers. For sure. Things don't always go the way that you forecast them to. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So you have the speaking gig, you have the book and you run a mastermind. What other things are you doing to like, generate a consistent income and give back and all that stuff. So when I launched my first group coaching program, which was during COVID, one of my attendees ended up being a board member for a number of different companies. After we worked together for a year, he taught me a great lesson. You can go from being a mentor to being someone's mentee and flip the other way. I was mentoring him. And then he came to me and said, I think you should look into becoming a, a, a board member, Heather. Like, why wouldn't you be advocating for board seats? And I just hadn't thought about it since I had been in the C-suite at the other company that I was with. I had always advocated for me to, to get a board seat. I never was given one. And so few women, obviously, are on board seats. And so he said, I'd be happy to advocate for you to the companies that I'm sitting on board. You weren't having a seat. So he did. And I landed my first paid board seat, which has been, you know, an incredible experience. And I'm just so grateful to get show more female representation in boards. Oh, wow. When did you land that? That was in 2020, the end of 2020 or beginning of 2021. Wow. Okay. And you're still there. Oh, yeah. I've been there, I guess, about four years now. Wow. And is that one of your favorite roles? Yeah, it's incredible. I with an incredible team, brilliant men, 
and a female voice gets is heard. So yeah. it's really great. No, I have a girlfriend that's big into board seats and it's just so fun to hear the different stories and the way the businesses are moving and how more women are getting into those fields. You seem to pick careers that are minority women. Or they pick me. It's like the thug life. <laughs> the thug life. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what do you hope to change in those industries for women coming up? I just feel like someone was there before me, right? Like Sarah Blakely started her own company long before I did and became a billionaire. And that showed women what was possible. I remember when I got the call, um, Saudi Arabia was calling me to ask me to come be a keynote speaker for the Leap Conference, which is the largest technology conference in the world. And everyone was telling me not to go. This was just a couple of months ago. And everyone said, it's too dangerous. You can't go. You don't speak Arabic. You know, you're not familiar with the Muslim culture. And everything told me I shouldn't go. But I remember thinking, but if I can go there and show just one woman in that area of the world what's possible being a woman, then I have to go. I don't have a choice. And it ended up being the most incredible experience of my life from a business standpoint and culture standpoint. It was unbelievable. But that just drives me, that idea that someone did this before me, someone paved a way for me. It's now not only my desire to do it, it's my work. It's my life's work. I have to get up there and do it. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about how that expanded into so much more for you this past March. Oh my gosh. Well, this is so interesting. So I said, yes, I closed my eyes. I'll never forget. I just closed my eyes and hit yes. Cause everyone was, I mean, they had security people reaching out to me, telling me, don't do this. This is crazy. And so I was very nervous, but I closed my eyes. I just said, yes, something inside me told me I should go. And bef- within probably two weeks, I got a call back. Hey, the princess of Saudi Arabia would like you to interview her while you're there. I'd gone out to do a keynote. And so they said, would you say yes? I said, yes. Then they reached out to me about the CEO of TikTok. Then they reached out to me about Stephen Bartlett, the CEO um, of the CEO Diaries, largest podcast in the world, right? Yeah. So like I, I, it was just one call after the next, after the next. And they just, you know, I got these incredible opportunities to sit with and interview the most brilliant minds in the world which I would never would have had access to. I was invited to the palace. I was a guest of the ministry. I I can't tell you how incredible this experience was. And now the people that I have, you know, in my contact list that I would have never known otherwise, it, it doesn't happen if you don't step into the fear. It doesn't happen if you don't show up and and not knowing what you're going into, but just put your best foot forward and go for it. I love that. I love that. When I got into my car wreck, I remember the guy pulling down the windshield and he, we caught eyes and I finally heard what he said because I was looking at him and he's like, are you okay? And based on his facial expression, there was no way I was okay. And so I'm like, okay, I can't believe what I see right now because it's too overwhelming. So I closed my eyes and I wiggled my fingers and toes. And I remember thinking to myself, I can feel my fingers and toes. I can feel my fingers and toes. Like, I'm going to be okay. Like anything outside of me is a story and inside of me, I know the truth. And I love how before you took on this gig, you shut out the world and you just said, okay, wait, this is noise. How do I tune into me? What is my intuition saying? And it's saying, I'm a yes. And when we lean into those yeses, the things that unfold are just completely magical that we can't even begin to comprehend before we took that first step. Yeah. So true. That's amazing. Um, What is your fall like right now? So yeah, I'm super excited. I'm taking the biggest US stage. Well, two things that are incredible. Um, One, I am taking Tony Robbins stage, which is something that was- You've always had that on your list. I've had that on my list for six years. That was like a bucket list for me. It took me six years to get here, but I've got it and it's happening Monday. So I'm so, I'm so, so, so excited and I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. Um, And then I was giving a speech in DC last week and I was getting off the stage and this woman approached me and she said, Heather, I said, yes. And she said, I'm Christine from the White House. And I said, excuse me. And she said, we were here to watch you. We'd like to have you come speak at the White House. So I'm going to be, I don't have a date yet, but I'm going to be speaking at the White House this year. So like these incredible opportunities just keep showing up and on now the regular. And it's just, the funny thing is someone said, me, oh my gosh, aren't you so nervous for Tony Robbins' stage? I said, no. And I said, you know why? Because I went to Saudi. Like 
that was, there was 380,000 people there in a country that didn't speak the language. And I challenged myself to learn some Arabic so that I could speak Arabic from the stage. Not a lot, but a little. And like, I was one of the only women without a headdress on. And like, it, there was so many reasons for me to be scared there. And I made it through that week alive. Like, and it went well, and I felt good about it when I left. And so now it, it just builds that confidence muscle that I don't think I'll ever be scared again after that. Like, yeah, I mean, I shouldn't say that. Maybe I'll go to some other part of the world that I have no idea about and take a stage somewhere that I don't speak a language and that's going to be intimidating too. But I don't think in the U.S. I ever will again. Yeah, this is home base. This is like home court advantage. Home court advantage for days. That's right. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, and I think fear shows up in different ways at different times for us. And as we become more familiar and more talented in whatever we're doing, that fear changes and then it's like getting into a new field or a new something that where it gets exposed. Absolutely. But if you can lean into like your zone of genius, which is obviously the space for you, like everything's good. Well, I mean, listen, there's plenty of problems along the way and there's always something going wrong. But like the more comfortable you become with that, that it's totally uncertain. I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm sure, you know, I, I was interviewing Stephen Bartlett live on that stage in Saudi and an alarm started going off. And I looked at him and I remember thinking in my head, you can pause right now and I can see our team is, you know, behind the curtain and everyone started putting their head out. And I, I thought to myself, right now you can pause and ask everyone to stop or you can lean in and just get really loud and hope he follows your lead. And I just did. And he right away did. And it was, and we like yelled over it and people went crazy and it ended up being wonderful and it, like it worked. But those are the moments, things were like that are going to go. I was doing, they had me do interviewing a unicorn panel, which is all billionaire founders you know, people making way more money than I've ever seen in my life, right? And so much success from all around the world. And my mic came off, right? And it's like, like there's no, you can't say, oh, hang on a second, everyone. My mic just came off. You just have to keep going, right? And so it's like all these fails and, and challenges that occur just build you up to say, okay, no matter what is going to get thrown at me, like I'll figure it out. I'll trust myself and we'll find a solution. Yeah. Well, the key to what you've been saying is keep going. You right. Like keep going. things are going to happen. Things are going to happen. Things are going to go happen. And whatever you do, you just got to keep going and just trust that, hey, whatever movement you make, everybody's going to adjust to that and then adjust and adjust and adjust. And if know. they don't, then you adjust. Right. Like it's, a you know, you just, you know, there'll be a way through, like you'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Do you have another book in you? Gosh, everybody's been asking me that lately. I do. I already have the name. It's the secret art of skipping the line. I started mapping it out. Honestly, it's so funny. I have not sold so many books that it fiscally makes sense for me to actually do. Like it, it would be, I would be doing it just because I'd want to do it, not because it's financially beneficial to my business at this point, because that's not a revenue driver for me right now. Mm -hmm. So from a business standpoint, I kind of look at it, I'm like, you shouldn't spend your time doing that. So the more people ask me, I'm like, go buy more books then. <laughs> show me the money. Like show me if that's really what you want me to do. But if I make a lot more money, you know, from, um, speaking for sure. Like I'd rather, and I love doing it. I'll lean into that until it, I see that there is a market for, for books. But I, I, I mean, I don't know that you feel this way, but it, it, there's so few people that sell millions of books and really move the needle. And I did it twice. I'm like, I don't know, maybe I don't, I don't need to do it again. We'll see. Yeah, no, I would say that it gave me the opportunity to learn a lot about myself, right? Like the, the art of writing is a process and you realize like where you're getting stuck. You realize like how you're telling the story and are you a victim or are you a victor? And then you publish this thing. And I just don't think people read as much as they used to. It gives you not. credibility, right? Like people are like, okay, she's organized in her thoughts. This is what she can talk about. We'll definitely like hire her for this, that, or the other thing, but I'm in no hurry to write another one put it that way. Like, like check the box. Right, Thank right. you very much. And keep it moving. <laughs> yes. And next thing, please. So perfect. How do you balance being a single mom and doing all the things that you do? Oh, I was just telling you, it's so much easier now. My son's 17. So anyone listening, if you have little kids, I feel for you, it's so much harder when you have little children. It just is. And so you have to get help. I mean, that's, I had to hire help to watch my son when I was traveling, right? Like I didn't have a better solution. I don't have family where I live. And so um, that was, you have to learn to rely on other people and ask for help and, and invest in help. That was important for us. But now I'm so, it's so easy. He drives, he, he can, 
actually make himself something, right? Like I can mm-hmm. leave and he's fine. It's, it's a completely, the game has changed when they become 17 years old. Oh, I agree. I have a 17 year old and it's like, oh, and you can pick up your sibling from practice. And I forgot milk. So can you grab that? Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. On payroll. I'm like, finally, this is paying off. Yes. So yeah, no, that's funny. Have you ever said no to a deal? That yeah, you've been offered. of course. And how do you know that it's not right? Because you just know. I mean, some people just are not going to align with you. And you'll see, I always, you know, have a pre-call before we make a decision if we're going to work together. And that's really where they're interviewing you, but you're interviewing them as well, because I'm not the right fit for every audience, right? I mean, there's some that I just know ahead of time. Oh my gosh, I, without a doubt, this is going to be great. But some I'm, you know, I wonder, and I, I like to ask, you know, who are past speakers that went really well? Who's bombed and why? What does your, you know, what does your audience look for? And what is your ultimate goal? Right. And if I hear some things in the feedback that I'm like, "Mm, this is not going to work for me, I I just tell them the truth. I want to do a great job wherever I go and I don't want to let people down. So I'd rather just pass on something than try to show up and be someone different than who I am. Mm -hmm. Has that always been easy for you to do? Or is that something like something's happened and you realize, okay, I need to stay in my lane? In corporate America, I definitely got so much direction you know, be telling me, don't wear skirts, don't wear your hair in a ponytail, don't wear this, you know, dress a different way, talk a different way, tone it down. And I tried to play that game. And listen, it worked, right? Like I made it to the C-suite. So I'm not going to tell people not to do that. However, I didn't become the most powerful version of myself until I disregarded everybody else's advice and started just listening to my own. So yes, it served me in a path that I was on in corporate. But now that I'm out of that, I've just let all of that go. And I just listened to me. Yeah. Yeah. And how have you developed that confidence? I know you write books on confidence, but like everybody listening today, what's the steps to starting to trust this inner voice when you've shut it down for so many years? The best way to amplify your inner voice is to do it in solitude. And that's for me was journaling. So you're going to be real with yourself when you're sitting alone with a pen and paper and spoken word, writing something down is so incredibly powerful. So get familiar with who you really are by writing at the end of your day, even if it's just for five minutes, write in a journal and just write like how you're feeling and what you really think. And then you start going back and looking, oh my gosh, I was right about that person. Oh my gosh, I got to start listening to this voice. And then as you start taking action to back up what your inner thoughts are telling you, boom, that voice is amplified and you, you can't stop hearing it. Yeah, I agree. You build that by trusting it and you trust it by watching it. And you're like, oh, okay, that felt off. And now I know why, because it's not always in the same moment that it feels off, right? It feels off. And then six months later, you're like, "Mm, there it is. Thank you very much. That's right. Yeah. What other practices do you do for self-care? I mean, I work out like a maniac. I try to meditate at least a couple times a week. That's like new for me. I'm, you know, I, I try really hard. Um, I love being outside. So I run outside. I live in Miami, as you know. And then, you know, spending time with people that I love. I do not, a lot of times people will say to me, you know, oh, you should see so and so or this one, like, you know, to social climb. That's not my gig at this point in my life. Like I, if I'm going to, if it's outside of work and I'm not paid for it, I'm only spending time with people I genuinely want to sit down with. And if I don't feel like, "Mm, I'm not feeling it, I I don't go. You don't go. No. Awesome. Do you belong to any masterminds yourself right now? Or do you feel like you've done that cycle? I don't. Yeah. I feel like um, I have so many of those people socially in my world right now that, you know, I have dinner with, I talk to on the phone that I don't feel like a need for that. I mean, I'm sure at a different point in my life, I'm sure I probably will again, Mm -hmm. but today, no, not right now. Yeah. No, I go in and out of those phases too. And I think it's important to allow yourself that permission to be like, Hey, right now it feels good to be accountable to a group and get all that going. And there's just seasons of, "Mm, I need to be reflective. I don't need any more input. Yeah. Or I'm just too busy and I don't need to put more on my plate right now. Yeah. 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 Do you, how do you balance that? Like how, when you get offers and you look at your calendar, are you saying like, okay, this is a great deal. So I'll squeeze it in. Or you're like, you know what? I already have so many events this month and I want to maintain a certain level of sanity. So I'm going to say no. Well, I think that for me, it's always about the travel. Okay. Right. So I live in Miami. So if something's on the East coast, it's so easy for me to go, you know, it's a couple hour flight or it's like an hour flight. If it's easy to get in and out of somewhere, I'm probably going to show up because I, my whole mission in life is to help people and bring messages forward that can help transform people's lives for the better. So I'm probably going to go. But when I start seeing things and it's like changing flights and, you know, eight hours, I'm like hard pass. You know, I don't think that's the best use of my time. 
if I have a lot going on. But if I find something, my friend on my way in here to meet you today, just text me. Hey, I am speaking at this tech conference. It's 45 minutes from Miami. I would love to add you. It's not your standard budget though, Heather. What do you think? And I I said, give me the date. I was open. I'm like, let's go. We're we're great friends. We can go together. And it's a 45 minute ride. Like, let's team us. Let's go. Like, that's fun to me. I like to do fun things with good people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's nice to be able to put yourself in that position. And it's crazy to think that six years ago, this wasn't all here. And like what you've created in this short period of time. Did you have goals of like, I know you said you had the goals of being on Tony Robbins stage someday. And that was like a reach. But did you have other things that were in that that you're now hitting? I mean, I always wanted my first book to become a movie. And I've come so close to that happening. And I've met with Netflix. And I met with so, I mean, so I think I, I pro- that's probably going to happen. I kind of have a feeling that that's going to happen. I mean, I'm always, everything's fluid, right? Things are changing so quickly in our world that I, when I was in corporate, I was very fixed um, thinking like it has to be at this date, um, this will happen. At this date, this will happen. I'm way more open now to this idea that, yeah, maybe I do get my own TV show or maybe, you know, I do write a third book or maybe I partner with a brand and, you know, we launch some other whole initiative. I'm open to it all. As long as it's under the umbrella of helping others, empowering others, driving revenue for me and my family so that I can do good and give back. She is clear and with clarity comes prosperity. So we know that. I love that about you though. Like this is who I am. Take it or leave it. I don't care. Moving on. Yeah, no, for sure. But I've always been direct as the day is long. And I love that about other people. And that's also another, when you were saying like, how do you choose things? If somebody, if I don't think somebody's honest or, you know, being real with me, Mm -hmm. that's another reason when I'll just kind of peel away from situations. I've learned that's a red flag. I look for green flags now in people, which is like honesty, doing good, caring about others, you know, showing up as who you really are, flaws and all, and not being fake. Yeah. Have you seen that meme right now on Instagram where it's like, I thought I was going to a carnival and I had all the red flags and they like still showed up? No, it's I didn't so see it. Funny. <laughs> you have to show it straight. <laughs> I wanted to show you. I, when he said, I only look for green flags. And there was like, literally, she's like, I thought it was a carnival. It had all these red flags. And I said, yes. And look at the mess I'm in. <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, but what are your goals that you haven't achieved yet? I mean, th- listen, there's always that next level, that next rung, right? Like I want a plane so badly. Like I, that's on a bucket list. Like I want, and I don't have to own it, but I need to have a share. Cause I'm so, I spend too much time with delays and sitting in airports. And I, that's like frustrating as all get out to me. You know, I would like to be so much more involved with my church and the charities that I care about. But right now I'm still in the building business phase. And like when I was in corporate, I was able to do all those things. So I built my career in corporate for 20 something years. You literally start over as a rookie and a beginner when you start a new industry, right? A new business. So I'm still in that building phase to like get this company to where I want it to be from a revenue standpoint. So I can start doing the give back things that I I really love to do. Mm -hmm. No. And and I love that you're allowing yourself that time instead of your talk is so positive about yourself and so positive about the growth phase and like, here's where I'm at. And when you're at this stage, this is what it looks like. And sure, I can't wait till I get to this mature stage that I get to do all these other pieces, but I'm not there yet. And I'm not shaming myself. I'm not angry about it. I'm not whatever. I just understand that that's my journey. I'm my biggest hype person. Like if you're not your biggest cheerleader, why would anyone else be cheering for you? Yeah. And did you always like that? Or like, how did you learn that? I learned that by advocating for others when I was in corporate and helping to elevate them and get them to succeed. But when I wouldn't advocate for me getting frustrated that I wasn't getting promoted and realizing I can't get mad at others for not elevating me if I'm not elevating myself 24 seven. And so I decided to flip the script on that. I'm like, yes, I'm still going to advocate for all my people and I'm going to advocate to get them promoted, but I'm going to be right there advocating for me. And as I did that, I started ascending. Hmm. That's amazing. I mean, I think that's something that we all have to realize. Like, I can't cheerlead you if you can't cheerlead yourself. So once I learn how to cheerlead myself, then you learn like, okay, Jen's confident. This is who she is. This is how I push her out because this is how she pushes herself out. So that's how I can elevate it. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so if somebody's getting into the speaker field today, what advice would you give them? Gosh, I mean, listen, it's not an easy journey, right? It doesn't happen overnight. I know one guy it really happened overnight for. He was a former pastor. And so he had been speaking, you know, for 20-something years. He met an agent who fell in love with him, and boom, he 
blew up. It was one year. That's the only story I know of someone that actually like within one year blew up and was able to make millions in speaking, right? So that is not the norm. So you have to understand that you're probably going to want some other revenue streams if you don't have someone supporting you or helping you in some way. And you're going to have to grind for, for a bit. You might have to speak for free, you know, do what you need to do to get testimonials so that you can build a reel so that you can, you know, build a speaker kit and a speaker one sheet. And then you can start pitching yourself to agencies and right. Like there's this whole process. And again, for different people, it can spin out and become extremely successful. For me, my biggest game changer was my TEDx talk. Right. So that took a year to get like all these things don't necessarily happen quickly. You have to have patience, but you have to persevere and just like keep swinging for the fences. Mm -hmm. And when you were calling companies, how are you getting like, were you buying lead lists? Like, how are you getting the contacts to the companies to buy? Hey, I'll come speak. Here's my books. Let's do an exchange. I just started Googling like big companies in Miami because I didn't want to get on planes. Yep. Right. So I was like at the top. 50 companies in Miami. I'll just call those first. Like it just made sense. They're, they're large. They're going to have a budget. Mm -hmm. If they're large, they're going to be able to buy my books. They're, they're large. They have enough employees I could speak to. Mm -hmm. And so I just started there. Mm -hmm. And did you do networking groups in the beginning? No. No. You were able to stay out of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not normal either. Everybody was watching. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people like start networking. Or did you ever do Toastmasters? No. No. Rotary clubs? No. No. Okay. What was your like favorite speaking gig so far? Monday, Tony Robbins. No, I haven't done it yet. Yeah. Um, I probably Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's the biggest one I've ever done. And, and so, it was so wild that I was in a different country. It was in the Middle East. It was so it was incredible. How has the time change? That was really, really hard, I'm not gonna lie. And yeah. when I got home, um, I it, I was a mess for a week. That was the hardest part for sure. Yeah. No, it's hard. That's when bad. I go on climbs and come back, I do cryotherapy like religiously to try to bounce back as fast as I oh, can. I, did. I wish I had known that. I, all I did, read, read was an article that Taylor, Taylor Swift wrote, like wherever you are, whatever country you're in, just be totally present in that time zone and try to get out into the sun in the morning. So that was like the only advice I have. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. <laughs> yes. Okay. So additional advice for anybody who's watching that helps with time change is mm -hmm. as late in it, like when you start getting tired in the late in the day, if you have cryotherapy near you, you go into a cryotherapy because it causes a dump of adrenaline and all this type of stuff mm -hmm. into your body and you get about another four hours. Oh, wow. And so then that, you know, that just helps because it yeah. delays everything. And you, you need adjust. anything at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my audience is in love with you because I'm in love with you. And we're all think like, rah, rah, Heather. How do we follow? How do we support? What do we do? I'm at Heather Monahan everywhere on all social media. My podcast is Creating Confidence with Heather Monahan. My book, Our Confidence Creator and Overcome Your Villains. And my website's heathermonahan.com. Yes, and we buy all her books multiple times. So she writes us another one. <laughs> okay, so there we go, team. Let's go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>